You know, there was a time when a man's word was his bond. There was a time when people thought long and hard before they made a promise because they intended to keep that promise. Today, sadly, promises are easily made and easily broken. Today, we overpromise and underperform. Today, professional politicians, professional politicians, that's why we need more non professional politicians. <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah. They spend half of their time making promises and the other half making excuses. A lawyer friend of mine a number of years ago, a lawyer, mind you, said this to me. He said, lawyers would have a hard time making a living if people kept their promises. There are some people even try to make promises to God. To God, mind you, of all, of all things, to God. When they're desperate for help, for his help, but as soon as the crisis is over, they don't even remember their promises. It's like that pilot and his navigators were crashed and see a single engine plane, and they were drifting in the small boat for quite some time without food and without water, and they were getting really desperate in this little lifeboat. And after a while, the pilots start praying. Lord, you know that I've not lived a very good life. You know I've been a lousy husband and a miserable father. Uh, I've cheated and stolen and have not had much use for the church. But God, if you will save us from dying, I promise you to never, at that point his navigator said, stop, stop, don't say another word. I can see land. You say he knew, they knew each other very well. Why am I starting this message about Elijah in this period of time in his life and this passage that we're going to be looking at it about the promises of God? Because if I am observing correctly in our culture, so many people view God as they view people. They think of God as just like another person. Uh, they think that because people don't keep their promises, the God doesn't keep his promises. That, that, that's the way they think. Because people renege on their promises, well, God could renege on his promises too. Through the years, through the years of ministry that I have come across so many people who think that... Um, if they had a terrible earthly father, they have a very difficult time visualizing the amazing, incredible, indescribable kindness, love, mercy, grace, and justice of God as their heavenly father. They really do. One, one man said to me years ago, he said, when we sing uh, oh, good, good father song that we used to sing here, and, and he, he would say, I, I can't sing it. Because all he think about heaven and the Father is what he experienced with his earthly father. That's tragic. Because when anyone compares our heavenly father with a human being, it's a dreadful mistake. It's a dreadful mistake. No matter how great or terrible your earthly father may be, they can never, 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 never compare to our gracious, loving, infinitely merciful, infinitely just Heavenly Father. 
Another thing I need to remind you before I get to the text. God our God, always, just as we sang, always, how many times? Always. Keeps his promises. In fact, I can tell you categorically that God, of course, we know that he cannot sin. But I want to tell you something you can take to the bank. God cannot, cannot, cannot not keep his promises. Did you get that? God cannot be untrue to himself. God cannot break his promise. God cannot be unfaithful to his promises. Now, sometimes, because God promises us something, or promise in his word, it's not fulfilled in our timetable. When we want it, or how we want it, we think, well, God is just not keeping his promise. That does not mean that God is not keeping his promise. Listen to me. His delay does not mean denial. Of course, I'm talking about all the promises of God in the word of God. And in a minute, I'm going to explain to you the the two different promises that are in the word of God, the one that's conditional, unconditional. I'll come to that in a minute. But I want to testify to you there is something else that's also personal promise. God sometimes makes personal promises to his children. And that is to that person, not to somebody else. I could never come to you and say, well, God is telling me to tell you this. Now, that's manipulation. I've had people come to me one time and say, the Lord told me to tell you. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I spent three hours with him this morning. (laughs) He didn't tell me that. Let's get over that. It's manipulation. When God makes you a promise, it's to you. And sometimes I make the mistake of blabbing it out. It's between you and God. It's a personal promise. And that is why I want to take a moment and testify. Testify to the faithfulness of the Lord. I told this story back in 2019 in Cairo, Egypt, some Uh, of our board members who were with me for leading the way, and we were celebrating the 10th anniversary of Kingdom Sat, the channel that we broadcast in 200 million homes in the Arab world. Many of them are actually watching live. It goes live to 200 million homes in the Arab world from this pulpit. And I'll take a moment, and since I'm thinking of it, welcome all our viewers from on Kingdom Sat. We welcome you. We were having a big celebration in Cairo, and I told the story. Many of them, of course, identified. Some of them were my siblings and know the story well. Back in 1968, just remember that. It's not necessarily the de- remember the date, but just remember because of the period of time. In 1968, the Lord gave me a vision. I know exactly where I was to this day gave me a vision that he's going to deliver me from the bleak time in which I was going through, from this darkest time in my life, that he's going to deliver me, that he's going to uh, take me uh, to this great country in which from where he will touch the world. Now, that's a very heady vision for a 19-year-old, right? You have to agree. It's very lofty vision. But I said, Lord, I know that I can make one promise, that whatever you do with me, I will bring glory to your name, and it will be the goal of my life is to bring glory to your name. That's all I seek in my life. I have been from that moment I made that promise. Not that I've failed and got tired or didn't do everything right every time, but nonetheless. Meanwhile, what happened between 1968 and 1978, that's a period of 10 years. Uh, Lots of things were happening. 
And there were times when I began to doubt whether I heard God correctly or not. And never blamed God. Always thought that I may not have heard God correctly. Because during those 10 years, there was a time when I was less than minutes away from being liquidated and was promised by a very powerful, ruthless man that I literally would disappear without a trace. I faced death in the eye. Then supernaturally, God delivered me. Supernaturally, he delivered me, intervened. I ended up in Lebanon first and then to Australia. Now, all of these steps in my life as I told you, made me doubt whether I really heard God correctly. Listen to me. Far from blaming God, I blame my own ability to hear the promise of God. That was a personal promise, only to one person at one time. All the while, God kept assuring me that the original vision he gave me is his vision for my life, is his vision for my life. But after all these detours, <laughs> listen, I always get lost as soon as there's a detour because I have no sense of direction. But I'm going all these detours from where original vision was. And back then, I couldn't understand the detours. Now I can tell you what a wonderful, wonderful detours they were. Wonderful detours in Australia. Not only that I received the best and the finest theological training. I love so many seminaries in America, and many of the presidents are good friends of mine, but I've received the most solid, biblical, sound teaching anywhere in the world. But that was not all. I, God arranged for me to meet the best wife that I could ever hope for. <laughs> Three of our four children were born there. And yet not until 1979, almost 11 years later, did I look back. I look back at, at the personal promise of God. As I said, that's personal promise of God. I keep repeating that. And the faithfulness of God to his promises. In fact, it tears me up every time I reflect on it. The faithfulness of God. Say that with me. Faithfulness of God. You see, our God is the God who always, always, always what? Keeps his promises. Our God is a God who always, always, always faithful to all of his promises. Now you can open your Bibles to 1 King, chapter 18. Very short passage, verses 41 to 46. In the Pew Bible, page 558, if you don't have yours, so you can follow with me. Because here, in these very few verses, and those of you who have not been here, please download the rest of the messages so you can keep up with us. Here we see Elijah, the man of God, after this great victory on top of Mount Carmel, is kneeling on the promises of God. We see him right after that great victory, clinging to the promises of God. But before even I get to the text again, I want to just remind you of something that's very vitally important. So the Bible in the many, there are many, many categories, but I'm going to summarize them just in two, okay? There are promises that unconditional promises to all of God's children. Any of us can claim them because they are unconditional promises. They're in the Scripture. But there are promises also in the Scripture that are conditional promises promises, that you have to meet the condition in order to receive the fulfillment of the prophecy, uh, of the promise. Unconditional promises, conditional promises. I've already shown you there are some personal promises, but these individually to an individual person and limited to that person for one time.
In 1 King 18.41, immediately after this amazing, exquisite, supernatural manifestation of God's glory on Mount Carmel, where the fire came from heaven, licked everything in sight, not just the sacrifice, but even the, the wood and the stones. Right after that, verse 41, Elijah tells King Ahab to go quickly because rain is on its way. Rain on its way. Now, beloved, <laughs> that takes gumption. <laughs> That really takes gumption. That takes an absolute unwavering trust in the faithfulness of God to his promises. Do you know what it literally means in, 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 in the Hebrew language particularly? Elijah and I told you about the Semitic languages and how sometimes they get translated into English, but he literally was saying, you know, I can hear the feet of the rain <laughs> running over here, literally. <laughs> Very poetic language. What does Ahab do? Look at it in the text. He goes down, eats and drinks, as if nothing happened, just another day at work. <laughs> Where was Elijah? Kneeling on the promises of God. My friend, while the promises of God are 1,000% certain, they don't always take place in 90 days. Can I get an Amen. That's why I shared my testimony, some 11 years. Now here's something that I hope you'll never, never, never forget. Listen carefully, please. God makes a promise. Faith believes it. Hope anticipates it. Patience quietly waits for it. I wanna repeat that, okay? God makes a promise. Faith believes it. Hope anticipates it. Patience quietly waits for it. So what kind of a promise did God make to Elijah regarding the rain? What promise? It was a conditional promise. It was a conditional promise. Don't forget that. It was a conditional promise. What was the condition? Remember when Elijah was in Zarephath? We saw that a couple of weeks ago. Well, he's still in Zarephath at that time. But God said to him, now, Elijah, I want you to go and show yourself to King Ahab. Now, I don't know about you. I can tell you what I, how I would have reacted to this condition of the promise. I would have said, Lord, do you know this man has my picture in every post office in Israel? Lord, do you know that he has a ransom on my head? Lord, do you know? Do you, do, do you understand this man promised to kill me and not in a very nice way? As if you can kill in a nice way. <laughs> Remember, it has been three and a half years without rain or dew. Ah, but Elijah's obedience was the condition for the promise to be fulfilled. You see, condition. Always remember that. Listen to me. There are lots of people in the church of Jesus Christ, <laughs> lots of people, they want the promise without meeting the condition. Hello? <laughs> and they even quote the scripture and, and tell the promise, but leave the condition out. I'll give you an example. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you 
You know how a lot of people quote this verse? He'll give you the desires of your heart. God will give you the desires of your heart. Well, wait a minute. What about the first part? The most important part of the verse. Three and a half years without rain. Uh, but Elijah's obedience was condition of that promise. He met the condition. So much so, in fact, in, 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 many, in many folks, in modern church, in modern Christian church, um, they really do not want to meet the condition. And so when God doesn't give, fulfill the promise, it was, what happened? Why? Why, why is, where, where is God? Why did this happen? <laughs> In fact, I'm going to show you some examples, other examples from the Scripture. There is sowing and there's reaping, right? Jesus said, when you give, it will be given back to you, shaken and heaped over. And Now, people forget the fact that there is a time between when the farmer sows the seed and then he gets the harvest. See, they leave that out. Another example, Proverbs 3, uh, 3, 5, and 6 is a conditional promise. If you commit all, how many? All. All your ways to the Lord, he will bring it to pass. Now, many people, again, change this, and, and they take control over the love. They're the captains of their ship, and they are the masters of their life, and they're, they're in charge of their own affair. Well, God is not bringing it to pass. You haven't met the condition. Commit it all your ways. Another example is one that always used frivolously. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, not only to forgive us all our, of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, so many people just go through the motion of confessing with their lips, and they have no intention of the heart to forsake the sin. And there's no repentance. Only confession, whether you got the confessional box or the public confession or personal confession, whatever it is. Oh, forgive me, Lord. Now I'm gone. Now, when that happens, God is not obligated to forgive us. Confession without repentance is cheap. Now, don't forget that God promised to Elijah was a personal promise. I keep making that point made specifically to him for that definitive time. I keep emphasizing this because I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Please. Now, Elijah knew that when he aligns obedience with God's promise, God will answer. King Ahab went down to eat and drink and uh, but Elijah went where? Kneeling on the promises of God. Please, please watch this. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this because it's important. It's very important. Especially in our day. Both men saw the miraculous hand of God working supernaturally on top of Mount Carmel. Both men saw the power of of Yahweh manifested. Both men experienced the greatest intervention of God since Exodus. When God parted the Red Sea, one went down in a sort of a brutish, animalistic way, just eating and drinking. And the other went up in humility, clinging to the promises of God. Now, there's something else I need to point out to you here about Elijah's prayer. Are you with me? Yes. Very important. Elijah prayed specifically. He prayed specifically. Right? Yes. Well, 
those of you who are alert and looking at your scripture and heard me say this would say, wait a minute, Michael, there was no specific prayer recorded here. <laughs> now, it was a trick, I'm sorry. I apologize, but it was a trick. But if you really got it, pat yourself on the back, okay? Not rec- no, we know it, but not in this passage. The Holy Spirit of God who authored all of the Bible from Genesis to maps, <laughs> the Holy Spirit who authored all of the Bible tells us 800 years later what Elijah's specific prayer was, not in First Kings 18. Let me read it to you, James 5, 17. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed and earnest, earnestly and it would not rain. And he prayed and did not rain for three and a half years. And again he prayed and heaven gave rain and the earth produced its crops. Question. What was Elijah doing on top of that mountain? What was he saying? We don't know because it doesn't give us in the text, but I can tell you, I have no doubt he was saying, Lord, you promised that if I take my life in my hand and go and face King Ahab, that, you, that it would not rain And you told me again, if I take my life in my hand and go back to King Ahab, that it will rain. Now fulfill your promise. Please listen. As long as you see prayer as a burden or a duty or a task or as needed basis, your faith is going to be stopped. Be stunted. If you read my book, Life-Changing Prayers, I give seven examples from the scripture about the old saints praying, different ones, two women, five men, different prayers in the scripture. None of them, none of them, none of those prayers are ambiguous. None of these prayers are generalities. None of these prayers, oh, God bless everybody everywhere. (laughs) No, no. None of them a self-centered prayer. No. They're all specific in their praise, in their adoration, and in their petition. See, I also met people through the years... They're really good people. They're really wonderful people. They love the Lord. And and that's why I want to make sure you understand that I I met well-meaning people who have said to me, Michael, I cannot pray specifically because what if it is not in the will of God? And I told you, they're genuine people. They really are, very genuine. Uh, they, They have very good intentions. They feel that if they pray and something against the will of God, then they're going to offend God. I often tell them, listen carefully, I often tell them, if you are not praying against the Word of God, if you're not praying something that's contrary to the Word of God, if you're praying consistently for the glory of God and for the righteousness and the kingdom of God, then you just go ahead and pray. Seek God with all your heart in that prayer. You know why? Do you know why I say that? Because God is so big and he can sort these out. If it is according to his will or not, he'll sort them out. When our children were young, as I'm sure like all of your children, and when they were little and they would ask for all kinds of things, ask all kinds of things. What do we do as a loving, caring parents? We would give them only that which is best for them. 
I get amen, parents? And if we, who are made of flesh and blood, if we parents who, 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 who are human, who are struggling in our own flesh with issues, can sort out what is good and what's not good for our children, do you think the Heavenly Father cannot sort these things out? So if you're not praying something that is contrary to the Word of God, you petition God to let God sort things out. Can I get an amen? amen. In my own personal way, and I share this again only for the glory of God, there are times when the Lord gives me faith to pray for something or someone believing that God already answered, and literally I'll be thanking God for answered prayer. But it's not always. He doesn't do that very, sometimes he doesn't. But even when God does not give me the faith to pray for that person or for that thing or for his kingdom and his glory, whatever, I said, Lord, this is the longing of my heart. This is my petition to you, but I know you're going to do the right thing by them and by your kingdom. Listen to me. God, if God is so specific, I mean, if he's so specific in details that he tells us in Matthew 10, 30, that every single hair, well, for some of you follicles, because uh, I don't want somebody to say, what do I do without, I don't have hair, but that's, uh, <laughs> if every single one of our hairs chronologically recorded, he has them all chronologically recorded in heaven. Just <laughs> think about this. Every time I focus on this, it, it really, as the kids would say, blows my mind. If God that specific and detailed with you, you can be specific and detailed with him. Through the years, my wife and I on occasions, when we feel led of the Holy Spirit, come in agreement and we pray specifically, always consistent with the Word of God, always for the glory of God, again and again and again. <laughs> when His answers come, they're often bold, <coughs> clear, and specific answers. There are times when the Lord says, I heard you, but you didn't ask enough. Here's more. What does Paul say? He is able to do what? More. Amen. Elijah prayed specifically, but he also prayed obediently. And then thirdly, not only that he met the condition in obedience, but he prayed clinging to the promises of God. He prayed persistently. You often hear me say that God is not impressed with the length of prayer, the eloquence of prayer, or even the posture of prayer but he's impressed with the persistence and the perseverance in prayer. In Luke 18, you all know the story. Jesus tells the story in Luke 18 about the woman who went to the ungodly judge and pounded on his door, pounded in his door, pounded in his door, and he finally said, I suggest to get rid of her. I'll give her what she's asking for. I'll, 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 I will give her, the, the, I'll do the right thing by her. And then Jesus said, now just think about this. God is not like that judge. God is the opposite of that judge. God is the extreme opposite of that judge. He loves us. He doesn't want to get rid of us. He delights himself in hearing us and answering us. In Gethsemane, when our Lord Jesus was sweating blood, persisting in prayer to his father, 
Where were the disciples? They were asleep. The Syrophoenician woman who comes to Jesus on behalf of her daughter, and she comes petitioning him, and he tests her faith. He tests her faith, and she wouldn't give up. She wouldn't give up, and she kept on persisted, and she kept on persisted, and he answered her prayer. Now, I confess to you, I don't know everything about persistence in prayer. I know how to do it, but I don't know everything about it. I believe it. Persistence in prayer belongs together to God's promises. If you ask if something that's not promised in the Scripture, it's like James said, we pray wrongly sometimes. How did Elijah persist in prayer? Look at verse 43. He sent his servants, obviously where he is, the rain comes from the Mediterranean in that area. He comes, the rain comes from the Mediterranean, so he, was, he kept sending him back to look at the pattern of rain and the pattern of clouds seven times. Listen to me, underline it in your Bible, seven times. You would think after the first time, he would say, well, you know, uh, I may have misunderstood the Lord. I may not have heard the Lord correctly. I may not have understood the promise. By the second and the third time, he probably was thinking, he said, oh, Lord, I, I guess I had enough victory for one day. <laughs> Lord, you're sending the fire and manifesting yourself with great glory. That's enough. And stop praying. Fourth, fifth time, Oh, man, I come under conviction here. <laughs> Possibly began to say himself, did God really intend to send prayer right after this? Maybe it's going to come some other time. Or like some people do, they get angry with God when they don't get it at the, in, in, on their timetable. Oh, but not Elijah. He persisted on watching and praying, on watching and praying. He prayed specifically. He prayed obediently. He prayed persistently. But he also prayed expectantly. 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 He kept on sending his assistant, his servant, to look for, toward the sea seven times. On the seventh time... The young man came and saw a tiny cloud in that cloudless sky. Sometimes they say it's the size of a man's hand or size of a man's foot. It really doesn't matter. The translation, it means the same thing in, in, in the original. And what did Elijah do? As soon as they heard there's a little cloud in the sky, what did he do? He started handing out umbrellas. Why? He was expectant in prayer. He was expectant in prayer. When you go home, let me plead with you. Go back. Just look at the passage a little closely. Don't watch the television. Don't watch the sport. Don't, just, just spend a little time. Read the passage closely. Read it again and again and again. I think you're going to discover that Elijah would have been absolutely, totally, Surprised if God did not answer his prayer. Most of us get surprised when God answers prayer. Finally, when God fulfilled his promise, Elijah stayed humble before God. Now, don't miss that. It's very important. He stayed humble before God. You see, sometimes when God answers prayers and blesses us, some people would want to take credit for what God did. Well, it's, you know, it's my prayer or this and that and the other thing. Always giving the credit to somebody else. 
Well, you know, prayer did it. Now, prayer doesn't do anything. Prayer <laughs> tests God and takes hold of his faithfulness. But God is the one who did it, not the prayer. Did you get the difference? Yes. Who did it? God. God bless you. See, few of us, and I'll tell you this, and I want you to listen carefully. Very few of us can really handle victory and blessing. Very few can handle it well. Others would try to put human rationalization on what only God did. Well, you know, because of so-and-so did this, and because of this happened, because of that and the other thing, and the other. No! No! Now, my friend, listen to me. You don't have to be a great theologian to recognize that this type of rationalization about what God, only God did, does not honor God, doesn't bless God. Elijah, after victory, he tucked in his cloak and he ran before King Ahab. Now, beloved, this is an act of humility before God. You have to understand, in the biblical times, uh, a person running in front of the chariot of a king is a mark of great humility. It's a mark of subordinating yourself to him. Listen, listen I'm, I'm, I'm always giving you the natural stuff because it is very natural for any of us, including your pastor probably, would have said, to King Ahab, Ahab, I got you where I want you. Ahab, I am in and you're out. Ahab, I told you it's going to happen. None of that. None of that. Question. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he just take pride in what has been done? Because Elijah, listen to me, he was adamant that everyone must know that Yahweh and Yahweh alone did it. And he gets all of the glory. All of the glory. All of the glory. This was Yahweh's act not Elijah's. I often think what would really happen if God's people knew how to appropriate the promises of God and to meet the conditions in appropriating the promises of God. I, 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 my mind will, I, I, I just wonder at times. That's why I want to tell you this true story, hopefully to illustrate what I'm trying to say as I conclude. When Crawford, who was the well-known Canadian Indian chief, when the Canadian Pacific Railway sought permission from him to cross his land. Uh, this land was known as Blackfoot land. It's between Medicine Hat and Calgary so that the train can run through it. The executives at Canadian Pacific Railway were saying, what do we do? What can we do for this man who gave us that permission, who gave us, we want, to, we want to do something for him. And they finally came up with the decision that they will give him a railway pass in all of the railways of Canada. He can go anywhere. He can literally live on the train if he wants to. It doesn't, no limitation. And it's for life that he could do that, not just all the time, but for whole, whole of his life. Yet, 
Canadian Pacific Railway could not find a single record of this man availing himself to this privilege, to this privilege. I'm about to close, so please listen to me closely. Because this is a tragedy in the 21st century church. Tragically, this is how so many believers treat the promises of God. They may hang them on the wall. They may even know them by heart. They may even tell others about them. But they never appropriate them for the glory of God. This would be like someone handing me a check with so many zeros that will give me a shock. I've never seen that many zeros in my life, and I said, wow, what an incredible, incredible thing. And then I take that check, and I'll buy a very expensive gold frame, and I frame the check and hang it on the wall, and constantly look at it, constantly get to other people's attention to it. But I've never cashed it. And so, my beloved friends, whom I love dearly, the first step to appropriating the conditional promises of God is to fulfill the condition. And that begins with self examination. What is holding you back from meeting the condition? What's keeping you from fulfilling the condition and appropriating the promises? If you say, well, I can't do this, well, you know what? This is not the end of the road. You can always ask God to help you. He will help you fulfill and meet that condition. I've been there many times. And he did, and he does, and he will. And I can tell you this, you'll never regret it. Would you stand up with me, please? You know, just at this very moment, I, 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 I had no intention, this not planned. I, I just, as I'm clo closing the message, I sense the Lord to be saying, there may be someone here who need to ask the Lord to help them fulfill and meet the condition for the promises. There may be someone here who has never even given their life to Christ. There may be someone here who have prayed for long and don't understand why is the delay. As our musicians start singing, as I said, I had no, I'm sorry to surprise you guys, but y'all you you roll with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I want you to come up and come here and pray, and I'm gonna come and pray with you at the end of the first song. If you wanna say, Lord Jesus, I need your strength, I need your help, I've been wanting to meet the conditions of the promises. I've been claiming the promises, but I have not been able to meet that condition. You know what? God hears the prayers, especially when his body is gathered together because faith is exercised somewhere in this building, somewhere in this building. There's faith believing that God will do what he promised. Amen? Amen. Go for it.